2023. Today's work session is on the Portland Bureau of Transportation's strategic plan and budget. Before passing it to Commissioner Maps, I want to begin by thanking the Portland Bureau of Transportation for this important work session. After all, transportation is definitely one of the city's core services. I'll pass this to the commissioner in charge of PBOT, Commissioner Maps. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, today, we kick off the City of Portland's budget development process for the 2024-2025 fiscal year. Um, colleagues, I will be frank, I expect this budget cycle to be the most painful that any of us have faced during our time on this council. Now. This pain stems from Portland's unsteady economic recovery, emerging needs around houselessness and public safety, and fundamental changes to the ways that Portlanders live, work, and play. And we kick off our discussion of next year's budget with what I expect to be one of our biggest challenges, balancing the budget for the Bureau of Transportation. Briefly, here is where we are at with PBOT. PBOT has a structural financial problem. Our transportation system is largely funded through gas taxes and parking fees. In recent years, cars have become much more energy efficient, so receipts from gas taxes are in decline. On top of that, since the pandemic, we see more people working and shopping from home, so parking meter revenues are in steep decline. Over the past five years, PBOT has cut more than $20 million from its budget and slashed 60 full-time jobs. Now, even with those cuts, as we head into the next fiscal year, this council must cut more than $30 million from PBOT's budget. Let me be clear. There is no way to cut $30 million from PBOT's budget without deeply undermining Portland's transportation system. And let's be transparent. There are only two ways to balance PBOT's budget. We can cut services or we can raise revenues. Now, on revenues, colleagues, I will remind you that in the nine months that I have served as the commissioner in charge of PBOT, I have pitched two new funding sources to support transportation. First, I proposed a street fee to support roads and sidewalk maintenance. Um, that proposal went over like a lead balloon. Second, I proposed increasing parking fees. This council rejected that proposal, which brings us to the current moment. 
Over the next two hours, we will hear a presentation from the executive team at PBOT, which outlines the Bureau's current thinking on how to cut PBOT's budget by $32 million in the next fiscal year. And with that, I will turn the floor over to PBOT Director Millicent Williams. Uh, welcome, Director Williams. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Good morning, Mayor morning. Uh, William, Wheeler and uh, the city commissioners here assembled. We appreciate you taking your time today to have a conversation with us about the future of the Portland Bureau of Transportation. As has been stated, my name is Millicent Williams. I am the director of the Bureau and have been proudly serving for the past two months. If you'll give me just one moment, I need to Listen, silence could, my could phone. You, could you shove it just a little closer? A little thanks closer? a lot. Appreciate okay. it. Yeah, thanks. And I thought I'd silence my phone. Sorry. <laughs> I did not do that. All right. So we thank you for hosting us here today. If we can put the slides up. Great, thank you. You can go on to the next slide. Transportation and transportation related infrastructure is so present that it's practically invisible. You can't hear anything? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Great. Is this even better? Yes. Okay. Trying to do the six to eight inches and I guess I can't count. Um, so transportation and transportation related infrastructure is so present that it's practically invisible. From the moment that you walk out of your door, you are interacting with our transportation system. Every street, sidewalk, bike lane, bridge, signalized intersection, and street light represent much of what PBOT is and what PBOT does. As you can see from this image, PBOT manages and maintains over $19 billion in assets that are critical for keeping our city moving. But beyond the assets themselves is also a culture and community of engaged urbanists and transportation professionals, advocates, and local leaders who have invested in this city over multiple decades. Portland State's Transportation Research and Education Center, also known as TREC, is home to the USDOT's funded National Institute for Transportation and Communities and the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation. Additionally, Portland hosts the local headquarters of many national and international transportation-oriented consulting firms with hundreds of employees. Key selling points for real estate and tourism have been and continue to be around the availability of uh, walkability and bikeability of our city and neighborhood. And we continue to be a cultural symbol and leader in climate-friendly travel. Only two years ago, in the middle of the pandemic, we made international news when we named a new pedestrian bridge over I-405 after Ned Flanders from The Simpsons with the blessing and signature of native Portlander Matt Gronig, the TV series creator. We cut the ribbon on Ned Flanders Crossing with Travel Portland CEO Jeff Miller, who celebrated the way our city's transportation system has helped draw tourists to our city. Next slide. And then we have the work of the staff of the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Typically, we try to stay humble about our accomplishments, but I'm going to take a moment to brag about some of the awards, accolades, and grants that have come to the Bureau as a result of the hard work and expertise of our incredible employees. We've listed a sample of some of the awards we've received in recent years on the slide that you see posted, including the Ned Flanders Crossing, as has been mentioned, which you can see being installed over I-405 in this photo. In the last three years alone, our Bureau has been awarded almost $240 million from federal and state agencies to fund important projects and plans to further improve our transportation system in both safety and efficiency. It should be noted that the funding referenced is restricted to the projects and plans that are awarded. We'll provide more information about that as we continue in today's discussion. Next slide. The work goes beyond just managing our assets. PBOT programs, like the ones shown here, are crucial for building community, improving mobility, and even supporting whole industries, like our outdoor dining program does for the restaurant industry. Others are crucial for public safety and livability, like our A23 Safe Traffic Safety and Livability Hotline, 
snow plowing during winter storms, bridge maintenance, and signal and street light inspections, and so much more. Next slide. You've asked about our vision for the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Our vision for Portland's transportation system is simple. A well-maintained street and sidewalk system that can provide use to travel uh, the city safely, users to travel the city safely and efficiently, whether walking, biking, taking transit, or when driving personal or freight vehicles. A system that allows for the efficient and safe movement of goods and other uh, opportunities for climate-friendly travel op safe, I'm sorry, climate-friendly travel options as we move to the future. And this vision also includes the identification and maintenance of ongoing sustainable funding so that we're able to provide quality customer service and optimal asset management for a livable city consistently. Next slide. So why are we here today? As Commissioner Maps has highlighted, Portland's ability to deliver even the most basic transportation services is at risk. How did we get here? Well, the fact is that we've have, we have a severe structural imbalance in how transportation is funded in our city. The City Council supported policies and plans for a sustainable, climate-friendly, equitable, and accessible city that has been the basis for so much of our success and what has drawn people to live here for decades. That is ironically what's also putting us out of business. The more successful we are at reaching our goals, the harder it will be to implement Portland's vision for transportation to the point of impossible if we continue with the same funding model that we have today. You can go to the next slide. This chart illustrates the imbalance we are faced with. In the red, you see our restricted resources, which are about two-thirds of PBOT's total budget. This includes capital funding, uh, such as the federal and state grants that have been mentioned, transportation system development charges, which can only be spent on specific capital projects. It also includes revenue from permitting that goes directly back into funding that work, the permitting work, and interagency revenues from the Bureau of Environmental Services for sewer maintenance. Our remaining budget is our General Transportation Resources, or GTR. This consists of 60% highway funds, state highway funds, and 40% parking revenues. These are resources that we, use as a support, we, that we use to support basic maintenance and bureau operations. And as we've talked about this with you before, these are funds that have not been keeping up with costs and have been shrinking as people drive more efficient personal vehicles and since people shifted their travel habits as a result of changes brought on by COVID-19. However, even within our general transportation resources, we have restricted funds. You can see that in the sidebar. They include uh, City of Portland debt obligations for the Selwood Bridge, which is about $5.7 million annually. The Milwaukee Max Light Rail Extension, which is about $2.5 million annually. And ADA ramps through the Civil Rights Education and Enforcement Center, which is also known as Creek, it's a settlement that we have, which costs $9 million a year. In total, these obligations add up to $48 million annually, leaving PBOT with only $99 million my, excuse me, with only $99 million in flexible funding to support basic maintenance and bureau operations. The $99 million bucket that is currently facing a $32 million shortfall. Next slide. As you know, we've been taking cuts for several years now. This slide highlights that. Uh, we've made reductions uh, to address the revenue shortfalls. Over the last five years, we've had to take reductions totaling, as Commissioner Maps has mentioned, $20.5 million and 60 positions. We've also depleted all of our $63 million in reserves. We are keenly aware of the fact that the services we are providing today are currently not enough to meet the needs of Portlanders. Our staff feel the same frustration as the public on a regular basis because we've already made significant budget cuts and reduced many services. They really do want to provide a good service to the community. Our problems are somewhat unique compared to the rest of the city. Over the same time period that's mentioned here, the general fund discretionary resources have grown by 15% or around 90 million while we've been asked to cut to the same degree. This is not a new problem. We've been bringing this to council for the past 20 plus years. 
As has been mentioned, this is a systemic problem that we m must work together to solve. You can. I just got bumped off the internet. Okay. Jeremy, do you have it up? Could you plug in? Uh, I have friends in the She's almost back up. She's almost back. 20 second timeout. Any questions while we deal with some technical difficulties? Yeah, one technical question. Sure. The, uh, where'd it go? The, the MAX projects, um, how much longer will we be paying those annually? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jeremy Patton, Business Services Group Director. We have about uh, 10 years on most of the costs, and then the Selwood Bridge actually goes out a little bit farther, but the MAX is about 10 more years. So they're both 10 years, Selwood and MAX? 10 to 13, yeah. Selwood Bridge has a second debt okay. issuance that goes out to about 13, but most of it's 10 years. Thank you. Yep. Are we ready? Shoshana? Yeah. We're back. Okay. We're back. There. And... I don't know if it's the view, we're seeing it over there now. Okay. I can keep talking. It should pop up shortly. Okay. Council members can see it, the audience cannot. We're gonna proceed, there we go. Um, remember how I said a few slides ago that we're putting ourselves out of business? This slide shows exactly how much. Transportation revenues are not keeping up with expenses and further reductions or an influx of funding are required to maintain a positive fund balance moving forward. Per city financial policy, we need to show a balanced budget through fiscal year 28-29. This requires us to find solutions to offset a $163.2 million shortfall. It's also important to add that our budget includes approximately $20 million annually from fixing our streets, our voter approved 10 cent gas tax that is up for renewal next May. If that measure is not renewed, community members will see even more service reductions. So we are here before you today. We either cut $32 million from the $99 million available next year or find a solution, a combination of solutions uh, to fill the gap. If we must make a 30, uh, $32 million cut, you will not have the Portland Bureau of Transportation that you see today. Next slide. There are $99.3 million worth of general transportation revenue-backed expenses that we have control over and from which we need to make the $32.6 million reduction from. As you can see, the majority of these expenses go to support maintenance, safety, and livability programs. We're going to move on to talk about our strategic plan, but I want to pause here before we do and see if you have any questions about our financial situation. I had two related. So <clears throat> let's take a step back on gas tax. So that's up for next year. Um, and that's currently 10 cents. What's the? It's 10 cents. What have the discussions been around just a CPI adjustment? I mean, unfortunately, fuel doesn't necessarily move with uh, that's a great consumer price index, but just to index it somehow. Uh, th uh, that's a great question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, the Bureau and I are currently in uh, discussions about what proposal. The gas tax is approved by voters, so we have a current gas tax that's going to expire soon. Uh, we are taking a look at uh, what proposal we plan to send out to voters. I, I'm committed to sending a proposal out to voters. One option is a straightforward, just keep the gas tax as it is, move forward. We could also raise the rates. We could have a cost of living, inflationary. Uh, we could account for inflation there. Um, frankly, what we can't afford to do is have this be turned down by the voters. Uh, that would be a, a, a yet another truly devastating uh, uh, blow. Uh, but certainly, as we have these discussions, um, uh, I will be uh, in deep dialogue with members of council to figure out the right package to take out to the voters. And what percentage, of, can you just remind me, what percentage of PBOT's budget is supported by the gas tax? I'll shift that 40 over. 40% of, wait, is it 60? 60% 60, 60 of our uh, GTR is uh, supported by gas taxes. It's the gas tax, not the fixing Yeah, I can clarify. So the fixing our streets that we're talking about right now is not included um, in the general transportation revenues or what we're talking about today with the 99.3 million that's outside of, of that dollar amount. Okay. 
Ham Schaefer, Communications Director for PBOT. We consider the gas tax, the fixing our streets, 10 cent gas tax, to be part of our restic restricted revenue. Okay. We give a specific list to the voters when we put it out for vote, and then we follow that list. So a list it's, of not, it's similar to our grants and other funding where it's really restricted to specifically what is what the voters approve for us to do with that money. And then um, Commissioner Maps and team, just remind us, remind me what we have proved with respect to parking uh, earlier this year. What was proposed and sure. what, what did this body decide there? Yeah, why don't I turn, I'll turn this back over to staff so I don't. So we had lost. proposed a 40 cent parking meter increase per hour and we um, implemented a 20 cent per hour increase. And what was the projected uh, revenue impact of that decision to go from 40 to 20 cents? About $4.1 million. Four point one. Yeah. So we were gonna get 8.2 and we get, we're gonna get 4.1 is what we're projecting, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. To, to be clear, that that was an increase that was stopped. It was so an I increase on the rates. Cost correct. accelerations that exceeded the proposed increase in revenues. So when you say there's a reduction, don't you mean the cost exceeded the proposed revenues? It was a when I say a reduction, I meant a reduction to what we had forecasted. So we had assumed the forty cent increase in our forecast. So that's why I talked about it as a reduction. But it was a twenty cent increase on top of the revenues. Why did you assume it? Because when we had passed the resolution back in 2022, it had said, include this in your rates for the next year. And so with that, we went ahead and included that as an assumption in the rates. Okay, that's, we should check that because that's, that's an aggressive assumption. I prefer our budgets be conservative. We've removed any of those assumptions in the, in the future forecasts. Thank you. Yep. My question is about um, this slide with the, the arrows. Yes. Um, I see that in the in two of the fiscal years, you mentioned hiring freeze. Um, has that been true for the rest of the, the, the other fiscal years, or was it just in those two? I'm just wanting to kind of get some dimension to, to this. Hi, Tara Wasiak, um, PBAT Deputy Director. Um, no, it was just for those years as indicated. Um, early on in the pandemic, we expected, I think, like everyone, a recovery. Um, so we, we thought we were being conservative by having those hiring freezes early on. So those three remaining years, you resumed normal okay, hiring rates. Okay. And so what is your, um, have you been thinking about that in terms of moving forward? And like, what's your approach to hiring freezes and vacancies? And what is the status of that right now? We will be addressing that later in the presentation. Okay. Uh, yes, there is currently a hiring freeze that um, we've imposed on the Bureau. Uh, I imposed that last week, maybe the, uh, on the 25th, I believe I sent the message out asking that we freeze all positions that weren't critical to current operations. Okay, and that just started this, this year? That just started this year um, okay. in anticipation of what would potentially happen next year. So the hires would be based on the work that we were planning for next year. So that's part of why we wanted to pause that. Thank you. To what degree has the budget office been included in this analysis either of your uh, revenue forecasts or in terms of the expenses? Jeremy. So I've been keeping the budget office up to date on kind of where our forecast is at. They review it every single year. They look at our financial plan and review it and make commentary on it. Um, as far as a secondary forecast, they, I, to my knowledge, I don't believe they've done that as far as like double checking our numbers. So the, the numbers we're receiving today, have these been checked by the budget office? Yes, the budget office has looked at those. Eco Northwest has also done a study, and that's where the parking numbers so are coming they, from. So they would validate all of the forecast information that you're providing today? They could represent that it's accurate? Probably a best question for Director Grew. Director Grew, could you come up and answer my question, please? I, I just want to make sure we're, we're working from a clearly validated baseline in our decision making. It is correct that we review their forecasts each and every year. Um, to my recollection, we have not had any involvement in the forecast under which they are um, projecting for the future year. So it, it would be my assumption that prior to actually getting to the budget process, your team would have the opportunity as they do with all bureaus to review both forecast information that's being provided to us as well as the assumptions around expenses and shortfalls. Absolutely. That would be part of our financial planning reviews. 
Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry to call you up unexpectedly. Do you want me to stay or do you want me to leave? Um, yeah, you stay in the room. <laughs> you don't have to sit there under the spotlight unless you like it. Question maps, that's there. One more. My assumption, I wanted to use the word assumption just now, um, is that we compared this with other municipalities across the country because a lot of these conditions are not just specific to Portland. Uh, that's right. Um, we will speak to that a little bit uh, okay. later in the presentation. Oh, we, so there'll be comparisons. We will not show the chart that the team worked on. We'll speak to uh, general generalizations around some of the findings that we have, and we will not call out cities specifically. That is something that we're happy to share with you and your team, all of your teams, uh, after this presentation. But there are, uh, are a number of uh, different um, ways that transportation agencies and bureaus or organizations or departments are funded across the city um, and um, the options that we have are somewhat limited relative to some of the comparisons that we made and again we'll speak to that uh, as we move through the presentation well where i'll go with this commissioner maps is since this is a national phenomenon and we have federal and state grants that are fairly restricted yep is there dialogue amongst those in those positions uh, to adapt to the reality of what we're all facing today in this country with, with the largesse of the infrastructure bill and such? Uh, there is some, some dialogue uh, I'm around that, Commissioner Ryan, although I, I think the, the infrastructure bills that we look, look to in Washington tend to be for special projects that really um, fundamentally transform our transportation system, uh, move it in a greener direction, for example. Um, I think the discussion, which is just beginning to emerge in Washington, which is part of the solution, is uh, moving off of the gas tax, which probably means a vehicle's miles travel tax or something like that. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. Um, within the last nine months. Uh, we met with folks from the... Um, U.S. Department of Transportation, um, and I did explicitly kind of raise that question uh, with our partners in Washington. Uh, they are thinking about it, but I'll also kind of tell you, um, I think they are also looking for state-level leadership in this space, and within this space, I believe Oregon and one other state are kind of in the forefront of this discussion. But uh, being in the forefront in this case means that we are still years away from uh, implementing a meaningful uh, vehicle miles traveled tax. Um, you know, I'm thinking about it, the, leg the legislature needs to move forward. And if you think about it, there needs to be a lot of infrastructure that you build locally. Uh, the Congress probably needs to pass a law that says that you uh, put some sort of tracker in your vehicle that pays attention to how many miles people drive. You can imagine some of the controversies around this. Um, so there's a, um, a lot of work that needs to be done in this space. Um, there is, uh, um, I would not, we will not have, um, there's no magic bullet um, for this budget cycle that's gonna solve this. In the context of the next 10 years or so, I think we'll move in that direction. Um, but in the next 365 days, uh, we are not gonna see uh, some, some magic happen out of Washington. Okay. It's a it's a longer conversation, but the lagging action from those that are above local governments is always frustrating. And I think this is a topic that needs to be raised up to state and to federal. Uh, I, I, I agree. I would say that that is the deep work that needs to be done in the transportation space at this moment in history. I just have one more question, sorry. Um, so the climate definition on this slide right here, can you, can you tell me what you mean by climate response under the policy planning and projects? Um, Art, there's uh, some team members uh, on the Art, oh, state oh, your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Art Pierce, a Director of Policy Planning and Projects. Uh, so there's uh, team members on the planning team that are working in collaboration with Bureau of Planning and Sustainability on um, specific actions, program analysis and program response. And then there's a whole series of implementation actions that might stem into electric vehicles um, or decarbonization of, like, of the system or in sustainable transportation investments. So there's a whole myriad of directions that, that climate response uh, really is embodied within that work. Okay, and some of those involve uh, planners and long-range planning. Um, so there's some, there could be some reductions in the, the planners doing long-range planning, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and has, has there been an analysis between the long-range planning of PBOT and BPS? And is there sure. any duplications or opportunities to integrate? 
Uh, there's a lot of collaboration already. Uh, the Bureau of Planning really sets the stage at a broader sense through the comprehensive plan, um, and we participate in that and are integrated through our transportation system plan update. The, the, the work of the planning team is really focused on the implementation actions downstream from that collaboration. So it's developing specific projects, working with engineers and community on those projects, as well as developing programs such as our new mobility and electrification programs. Or, um, so it's, it, it, we work a lot with them. There, there's a little bit of overlap, um, but it is very small uh, relative to the overall uh, work program. Okay, I'd be really interested in looking to see if there's any opportunities for alignment. Um, sure, and, sure. And where there's duplication, yeah. there can be integration. Sounds great, yeah. I, I had one other follow-up question, uh, building off of Commissioner Ryan's question. So, by way of background, I ride my bike or take the train 90% of the time downtown. Are drivers subsidizing me in our current revenue model, given our dependency on gas tax and parking fees? I don't, I mean, I pay for my bike and maintenance, but I don't pay a fee to, to bike every day. TriMet Pass is being provided to me at less than, I think, the cost of my usage in a year. So, yeah, so that's the question. Am I, am I being subsidized by drivers <coughs> when I yeah. yes. commute? You are, yes. So what is the solution there? I mean, from uh, was that the street fees that, as you alluded to, floated like a lead yeah. zeppelin? Uh, is it, you know, how do we, how do we better reflect the cost of supporting cyclists and those who use public transit? And, you know, from a high level revenue, uh, approach to revenue generation? That's a, that's a complex conversation that uh, we would like to be able to engage this council in. Um, the street fee, um, while it was titled as that, uh, really could be manifested in any number of ways. We could look at individual uh, lines of service that could be supported. Um, we could uh, speak to an ADA um, uh, family support fee. Uh, there, there are a number of ways that we could get to um, having the whole of community uh, supporting the transportation network. Um, I think um, to just say street fee uh, kind of um, mislabels or, or doesn't give the full picture about what that could actually mean. So there's more opportunities for us to explore and discuss that with you. Um, we're gonna get to a, a couple of uh, revenue generation ideas okay. that we have as we move through the presentation, but that is indeed one that um, we think about all the time. Uh, how can we make sure that every user of our system has an opportunity to both use that system safely and to the extent that it's possible, uh, invest in it as well. Okay, thank you. Next slide. As directed in the uh, spring budget note, we revisited our strategic plan to make sure it was in alignment with community and council feedback, as well as our current budget outlook. Next slide. We're happy to report that we have a lot of overlap between our work and the city council priorities. 93% of the strategic plan objectives directly support these priority issues and lenses. A lot has changed since our plan was first adopted in 2019. Less than 12 months in, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to shift our working conditions, mobilize to support safe and healthy travel and commerce in our streets, and brace for uncertain public health, social, and economic ramifications that are still unfolding to this day. Despite all these challenges and changes, the core pillars of creating safer streets, enhancing mobility, and prudent asset management still resonate. These three core goals remain the central vision of our revised plan. However, due to changing conditions and the budget restrictions we all have already made, we have deprioritized de some actions within these goals. Still, we know we have more work to do. The next stage of our strategic plan refinement is the work we have to do right now as we determine what we will or will not be able to do with our current resources. And as I've mentioned before, the Bureau will be a very different Bureau if we're not able to identify ways to fill that gap. In order to help prioritize, we did three things. We reviewed our strategic plan for alignment with citywide goals and lenses, as I mentioned in the previous slide, 
and reprioritized actions identified back in 2019 to make sure that they reflect what is feasible in advance of 2024. We conducted public polling to better understand community priorities, and we used poll priorities in combination with city council priorities to identify the top three clear priorities and used these priorities as guidance for our budget reductions. I meant to clean that statement up when I was reviewing my notes. Sorry that I did not do that, but uh, long story short, we wanted to make sure that we were aligning our priorities around what people were asking for both from the council level and from community level. In July 2023, we conducted a series of polls and community surveys to get feedback on priorities for our work. We received overwhelming responses from Portland voters and the general public, PBOT staff, and our bureau advisory committees. We will speak to some key takeaways around community priorities as it relates to our budget conversations today. We also have the full DHM survey. DHM is a uh, firm that uh, does this type of work in community. Um, we will have that full survey available for you today if you'd like to have a copy. In addition to learning about people's priorities, one of the interesting findings from the poll is that people really do not understand how transportation is funded. When asked an open-ended question about sources of Portland's transportation funding, 40% of people simply mentioned general taxes. Next slide. Here are the top three highest priority services that people told us they'd like for us to keep. We've listed them by stakeholder group according to our polling and surveying. So the top line represents the DHM survey that we engaged DHM to do. Um, and then the second and third lines uh, are based on surveys that we sent out to all of our listservs sent out about 100,000 um, to about 100,000 emails, people who have a direct interest in what we're doing at PBOT, and those are the responses that we received. Um, we asked for the top priority areas they asked uh, for us to focus on, and we heard very clearly about the importance of maintenance and safety. The feedback came from a representative poll again uh, with 600 respondents, and we heard from about 6,300 people that responded when we asked some of the same questions through a survey that was sent out through, as I said, the lift service. We also heard it from our own employees, about 300 of whom when we asked. We also asked our modal advisory committee members and our budget advisory committee members for their feedback. These committees are made up of people who dedicate their time to volunteering and to help inform us in our direction as we wanted to pass along, and we wanted to pass along their feedback. While the sample group is smaller, we see their desired areas of concern and focus. In summary, our key takeaways from the feedback we've received from city council and the public are to focus on the transportation service areas that support maintenance, community safety, and livability. Our refreshed strategic plan speaks to these priorities. Uh, so what are the potential but, uh, cuts for the upcoming fiscal year? We entered the planning process with a fair amount of optimism, believing that we could identify specific projects or programs and keep much of our work whole. But we came to realize the total impacts and the depths to which we would have to go to get to $32 million. Our 13-member executive team who are here to provide program-specific insight and to assist with answering questions met for five to seven hours each week beginning in August to review our polling data, comb through every line item in our budget, and develop a cut list that meets our $32 million target. Can I pause here? I am, I'm reading Commissioner Ryan's face. What's up? <laughs> I, I think the... The two slides on polling was, were fascinating, and ah, uh, yes. it just seemed. Are we are we going beyond that now? Just so I'll loop back to we that. We can we can pause. Well, I want to make sure you get through the whole presentation. Sorry, I don't play. No, no, it's well. fine. Um, if, uh, let's we can pause. Go back. Go back. I, I think the big question I have. First of all, it was really helpful to see all the different points of view, and the first one seemed to be objective in terms of sample size and such. And then the second one was those who responded. So they're more, you know, clued in, I, I would say, perhaps. That's right. 
But I think what was fascinating is maintenance was number one until you got to the committees that are part of the Bureau. So I, I'm trying to figure out, like maintenance just went away. It was number one until we got to the Bureau and Budget Committee. And those are all appointments made by the Bureau that the Council approves. Yeah, with all those committees. Yeah. So maintenance just went away in those three committees. So that, I just found that to be fascinating. I'm sure it is an interesting too. data point. Um, we um, do want to make sure that we're taking those uh, volunteers, those people who have committed to this work, uh, their feedback very seriously. Uh, we talked with several of the committee members, committees in meetings about um, the outcomes of the data. They continue to understand the need for maintenance, um, but uh, wished to prioritize our attention on the things that were outlined um, in the survey results. Shoshana, can um, the team members make the, can you get the survey, yeah. <laughs> Is there so we're passing out the, the survey now, uh, the poll right data, okay. so that you can take a look at all of the questions. Uh, get Do you the think it's the tenor. way that the people who are on the committees and the way we talk about, I mean, it's puzzling. Like, um, why is I, I think we have an opportunity for... as, um, as a bureau yeah. uh, to help uh, people better understand the work of the bureau and how we prioritize that work. Um, the challenge is that, um, and this is more an editorial note than um, fact, it's um, anecdotal. Um, there was a time when the work, much of the work that you see done by the Transportation Bureau was done, for, was done by the Bureau of Maintenance. Uh, and so um, it was, there was not a PBOT, there was a Bureau of Maintenance. Some, how many years ago, Jody Yates, Maintenance Operations Group Director. <laughs> 15. 15 years ago, it was the, the Maintenance Bureau. Um, and so when people see Peabot trucks, when people see work happening, um, much of what they see is maintenance work. And uh, that's what they understand the whole of transportation to be. We recognize it to be much more than that. And those who are on those committees recognize it to be much more than that. So I think that that's where the disconnect is. So we have an opportunity to provide um, greater insight into all of the work of the Bureau um, so that the general public can understand all of it. But it, it is pretty complex. It is pretty tricky. There are the restrictions. Um, people don't understand why we do one thing versus another. Um, and us saying, well, the funds restrict us. We can't just pave. We have to do this. Um, that's a hard conversation to have, and our folks are out having it every day. The people who work in the maintenance bureau, uh, uh, excuse me, the maintenance operations group, um, face it every day. They face the public every day, asking them why they're doing what they're doing, uh, because they don't understand the bigger pictures. And I don't want to suggest that the general public is not um, astute. It's just a, a pretty complex um, pie that we uh, have to assemble, and so. Um, so we, we that, that, I think that that's a, a lot of it. That speaks to even the budget uh, challenges in terms of people understanding how the Bureau is funded. Uh, the number of people that we engage on a daily basis that say, we, we, our taxes pay for this, why aren't you doing this? And we're saying, well, actually, they, they don't. Um, uh, the, the, there are um, very limited funds that come from taxes that go into the transportation budget. And so, um, again, uh, we have an and opportunity. Overwhelmingly, that's what the public wants. And that's okay. and, and overwhelmingly, that's what they've said they wanted. Yes. Maybe later you could uh, send it to us privately, but I'd love to see how the staffing model mirrors these priorities. Sure. Not to say that anyone's job description is in one area, but I think you could still make. Uh, generalizations on what they're focused on. And you make a good point. Um, while we have um, a number of divisions and we've broken out the charts that you've seen the previous couple of slides uh, where each of the groups are divided out, and we're going to have a little bit more conversation about that shortly, um, many of the staff that work in the maintenance operations group or in engineering services or right-of-way services or in policy planning and projects or in engineering services, if I've already said that, or parking and regulatory have uh, split responsibilities across lines of service. So it's incredibly challenging to say, well, we'll just cut this uh, piece of our work or one person who does this one thing when cutting one thing could actually translate into, uh, and there's a real example of this, for FTEs if we cut one program. 
from one division for FTEs from another division would be impacted by that. So we're going to try to explain that to you um, in ways um, that help to bring that conversation up a bit um, so that we can see the connection. But that's part of why we have as many people here as we do, because it's, it's a, um, an intricate um, network of yeah. services and, and uh, Beginning of supports. a major reset, so yeah. right. thanks. I, I have a, a thought on that as well. I yes. mean, for, from my perspective, I, I think it's obvious why the bike committee and the pedestrian committee would prioritize safety. If you bike and you walk, and particularly if that's your primary mode of transportation, you're not gonna care as much about maintenance as you are safety particularly given some of the statistics we're currently experiencing in our city. So I, I think it's a very rational Absolutely. decision. Um, I, I also just would point out that we haven't really talked about our capital budget because that is part of the budget that is more secure. That is grant-based, that's federal-based. But the investments we're making, particularly around bicycle and, and pedestrian transportation will not be effective if people don't think they're safe. That's right. And so even though it's a smaller sample size, because you, you asked a committee of eight <laughs> as opposed to 600 in a representative sample, uh, I, I think it's worth noting that the significant investments we're making in the Green Loop, for example, sure. nobody's going to use it if they don't feel safe. Um, Absolutely. Um, maintenance um, projects have at their foundation safety. All of our projects have safety built into them. Uh, that is not just by accident, that's intentional. So as a bureau, we focus on safety in all of the ways that are important. The challenge that we have, especially with some of the infrastructure that services either um, those who are pedestrians or those who are cycling, is that that, that infrastructure also has to be maintained. Uh, yeah, it's and all, so, it's, as you yeah. said, it's, you, you can't really separate that's one right. from the other. They're yeah, all and so but, if but you it's look, a value that's being espoused. It's, it's, it's I, certainly a, a value that we understand completely. Um, and it breaks our hearts to think about the fact that some of the things that we've had to already cut um, have had an impact on some of the ways that people are able to use our system safely. Um, I'll speak to residential suite sweeping, which is something that we've cut in the last fiscal year. Um, that impacts the ability for people's bike lanes to be clear. Uh, that impacts people's ability to walk down sidewalks without uh, branches and weeds uh, in the sidewalks to be, be a challenge. And so um, we think about it all the time. The challenge is we, we are not physically able to based on not just the budgetary constraints, but then also then the physical constraints because we don't have the people to do the work um, to, to address satisfactorily not even um, above and beyond, but even satisfactorily that which we should as basic and standard. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, I'm gonna do a time check real quick. Okay, we only have, okay. Um, kinda lost my space, sorry. Uh, before we go further, um, I want to acknowledge that uh, you'll see some very difficult proposed cuts, very difficult. We've already been belt tightening for five years in this bureau. There are no easy cuts remaining. Our work is very interconnected, as I've mentioned. It is not easy to find cuts in one area that don't have a ripple effect throughout the whole bureau. Everything you will see um, is impactful, and you may think that some of, it, some of these cuts don't make sense. We don't think they make sense either. However, it was impossible to get to $32 million in cuts without making very challenging decisions. I also want to acknowledge that this has been very difficult, stressful work for the team that is assembled here today. These are not just numbers. This is work that we believe in, and this will impact our communities and our staff. We also have many PBOT staff who are listening here today. Uh, we're talking about their livelihoods and their hard work. PBOT staff have already been working under constrained conditions for several years, and these potential additional cuts will be difficult for staff to hear about. So our first cut attempt <coughs> led us to ensure uh, that we were holding priority areas um, of the public and city council harmless. Those include maintenance, again, maintenance, community safety, and livability. We were especially focused on trying not to touch maintenance 
much, since taking care of what we have is the foundation for all of the other work. So I know that this next slide is a bit of an eye chart, but um, what you see here is a list of each of the uh, PBOT groups. I spoke to that in a few, a few moments ago. The programs in each of the groups and the total GTR budget in those groups. Under the cut one category, you can see the percentage cut that we identified from each of the groups. When we attempted to hold some areas mostly harmless, we were only able to reach $14.3 million in cuts, totaling 69 full-time employees. And I don't want to minimize the impact of this first round of cuts. These are still in areas that are fundamental to the, to the delivery of services that we believe community members expect from us. So we got to 14.3 million in reductions and recognized we needed to dig deeper. Realizing we would not be able to achieve a $32 million cut without reaching into priority service areas, we went back to the drawing board and identified additional reductions that got us to our total amount. This cut package of 32 million and 127 full-time employees has major impacts across the entire Bureau. The painful truth is that there is no way for us to take $32 million out of our $99 million in flexible general transportation revenues, cutting a third of our budget without huge impacts, but we did try. We can pause if you have questions, but we do have a few more things we need to get through. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to proceed. We now want to take a few minutes to go over more details about could, could each I, other. Could I just ask yes, one? Mayor, you, sorry. You know, again, we're sort of sliding by the capital projects. Are there any of the capital projects that could be reconsidered or pushed off in order to abate some of the proposed operating cuts? All right. touch on it. Um, what we have, we uh, allocate uh, one and a half million dollars per year to match all of our capital projects. So that results in about 150 to 200 million dollars annually of capital projects. Uh, we did not uh, cut that one and a half million in this because it would force us to give back those federal funds um, for those capital projects. What we did uh, reduce within this package was the GTR allocated to small capital projects, those quick build projects that don't match uh, those federal projects. So we did, that's included in this figure. So have you, and painful though it is to give money back right. to the feds, have, have we evaluated whether giving some of that money back in exchange for continuing to support a program here locally might be worth the trade-off? We certainly can talk more about it. It'd be one and a half million out of the total 32 million we'd need to come to, but it, it would contribute one and a half million. That, that's my point, yeah. so I'm just sure. asking if you've done Yes, it. there is the yeah. possibility. Yeah. We decided okay. against that leverage, yeah. decided that it was not a good choice for us, particularly given the critical safety improvements that those were being matched for those projects right now. Can, can, so. can I at some point get, we don't have to do it today, obviously, can I get a list the full of all of our list capital projects? of those capital projects. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And we have roughly 200 or so capital projects that, um, as has been mentioned, are um, the grants are, or the, the awards are made to address a specific problem. Uh, and typically when we uh, get those funds, they're not able to be used toward uh, basic maintenance um, uh, and safety unless it's a very specific type of safety to address a very specific But, but the match is general fund, or where is the match coming from? Uh, from this, this fund that we're describing, um, so it's within the 99 uh, million that we so, are. So the so match is flexible. I understand that federal grants yes. are right. rock so, yes. solid. I yeah. totally so, get and yeah, that. We would, be, we would be faced with giving back uh, grants. If I, I understand we, that. Yeah. So, so it would produce one, one and a half million dollars of potential okay. discussion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, about a nine to one leverage. Now, I, I, I agree with you as an overall strategy, it's not desirable, but I'm wondering if on the margin there might be some opportunity. Yeah. Could do it. Yeah. We did look at that, yes. Um, and so now I'm going to um, ask that the group directors speak to their areas, and I'd like to invite Jeremy Patton uh, to speak to the impacts of business service and the office of the director. Thank you, Director Williams. Again, Jeremy Patton. I'm the Business Services Group Director here at PBOT. As you saw in a previous slide, um, we're going to have to take some pretty deep cuts in business services and the office of the director. Can you move your mic? It's doing a thing. Better? I don't know. How's that sound? Good? Okay, yeah. sounds better. Um, 
So those deep cuts amount to about 44% in service reductions or about 33 of the 89 positions um, in those different areas. These services are the backbone of the Bureau and allow frontline services to operate smoothly and efficiently. So just to describe some of the cuts, we'll be able to provide minimal support for core systems, core um, technology systems, but we'll drastically reduce the technology support for program-specific software, leading to greater risk of system failures and data breaches. Uh, we will be able to get our employees paid, but the likelihood of errors is greater, causing more work to kind of clean up some of that um, on the back end. Payments to vendors will most likely be delayed. Uh, we will not have the capacity to follow up on unpaid invoices or explore new revenue options. The likelihood of financial audit findings will be great. Uh, our bureau-wide equity work, communications, and data analytics will still happen just at a reduced level. We'll have to reduce our, the number of our budget advisory committee meetings to kind of just focus around these next few months of budget, but we won't be able to staff that for the full year, and we'll have minimal support to respond to state and federal inquiries. We'll also have less support for asset risk management efforts and a need to eliminate our campsite cleanup funding. We'll be able to hire, but the hiring process will take uh, many months rather than weeks. And our onboarding, offboarding, um, Family Medical Leave Act, other employee support efforts will fall to the manager um, responsible for those particular groups. All this to say that the impacts will have a, a ripple effect throughout the Bureau and cause significant slowdowns to delivery of core services to the public. And I believe I am turning it over to Alex. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners and Mayor. Good morning. Alex, can you Hi. pull it closer and introduce yourself? Yeah, Thank about. you. I am Alex Bejarano, Interim uh, Group Director for Right-of-Way Management and Services. Uh, Right-of-Way Management Services is a service provider to many portions of the Bureau, including development, uh, people capital projects, and support of other Bureau's environmental services and water. Most of our funding in my uh, group comes from cost recovery revenues through permitting. Uh, however, we do have to reduce costs as well, and so what we're looking to do is eliminating the group director position uh, for this group. We'll also be moving uh, section level costs into more cost recovery models where we can, and move some of our community events, uh, which includes parades, street fairs, farmers markets, uh, what have you, uh, block parties, and moving those to a more cost recovery model as well and reducing the subsidies in those programs. In addition, we will also be reducing funding for the Portland Streetcar by approximately $1 million. This reduction will impact the long range plan to replace future streetcar purchases, which in turn will uh, create potential delays in streetcar operations. Could you be more specific? In the streetcar? Yes. So this $1 million is part of our uh, budgeted package where we would produ uh, purchase more vehicles. And so that process takes a while, so we would reduce that by $1 million, and then further pushing that timeline out so we potentially could have less cars uh, or less parts for cars as well as the system ages. Okay, thank you. And I am turning it over to... Uh, I can't see. Todd. Todd, Todd thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Todd Lyles, Interim Group Manager for Engineering Services and City Engineer. Engineering is made up of 115 staff who perform survey, design, engineering, construction, inspection, and quality assurance of our capital improvement projects. We also oversee all ADA ramp construction to accomplish ensuring 1,500 ramps per year by order of a City Creek Settlement Agreement. We oversee 4,800 lane miles of concrete and asphalt pavement evaluation and reporting and coordinate the annual paving program for maintenance operations. We report pavement conditions annually across the network, but our capability for reporting and timeliness of data with these reductions will be greatly reduced. We are showing the complete reduction of pavement preservation, which includes 30 lane miles of a combination of slurry seal and microsurfacing on our local streets. Pavement preservation also includes an additional reduction of 30 ADA ramps triggered by the by paving itself. Paving preservation is the most cost-effective asset management strategy there is because spending $1 today saves $10 in the future for the same pavement area. It extends the life of our existing pavement up to 12 years at the lowest possible cost. With these reductions, we are losing our partnering fund, which allows PBOT to contribute paving curb to curb and constructing an additional 25 ADA ramps when BES and Rotter need to cut into the street to construct their capital improvement projects. 
We want to be proud when we finish our partnering projects knowing that all paving and ramps are completed and residents are happy with the condition that we leave the street. Peabot will need to fund and find alternative means to construct these loss of ramps. We also repair landslides, tunnels, oversee 159 bridges, and engineer most emergency repairs in the right-of-way. In coordination with maintenance operations, we are showing a complete reduction in all Peabot-owned stairway, tunnels, and retaining wall maintenance. We will continue to do only minor structural repairs going forward. We are eliminating all landslide repairs and any major emergency repair work on structures. We will continue to design and construct only our major large capital projects. Couple of questions. Are, are you done? Yeah. Um, explain to me again, 50% of asset rating. Explain what that means to me. Yeah, so we have a group of asset raters that go out and evaluate our pavement conditions across the city. Currently, it takes us about five years to get across the city with the staff we have. We're gonna cut that in half. All right, okay, so that, that is a staff reduction. That is a staff reduction. That is a staff reduction. The, the we will lose the ability to, to gather uh, accurate data as much as we have. Okay, been. and then landslide and emergency repair work. Yep. I don't see any planet on which you could that you could cut that. I mean, if a landslide happens on West Burnside or something, you're not gonna attend to it. What does that mean? We need to come up with some funding to do that. We, they'll sit there. I mean, we have landslides right now we can't afford to complete. Some landslides require retaining walls to construct. Those are getting very expensive with the cost of inflation. Um, it's, it's tremendously expensive to fix the Sorry landslide. I asked. Um, <laughs> You have 30 ADA ramps. Aren't we bound by the settlement we arranged with the disability community? We absolutely and, are. And we supported that settlement. Are you suggesting we break that settlement? I'm not suggesting we break the settlement. We will need to find additional funds to construct those ramps in another way. We need to meet that $1,500, 1500 ramp goal. The pavement preservation and the partnering fund through those paving uh, opportunities also constructs ramp, and we count those towards the So let, let me read between the lines. Um, you're, you're saying this is what it looks like, but you're in no way advocating for this. Absolutely is that a fair not. statement? It's a very fair statement. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. So you're, you're lighting a fire under us and saying we need to find an alternative to fund these. You're not suggesting seriously. That I am not, these, these are GTR funds, that's why okay. they're selected. Thank you, because I, I'm struggling to see how this dovetails with what the director told us a few minutes ago about safety being the top priority for some and maintenance being the top priority for many. Absolutely. The, these strike me as being center of target in terms of the priorities that were identified that the director said you are using as the basis of your strategic plan, right? That's right. Okay. When you have to get to 32 million, this is the GTR to get there. Okay, and the, the reduction we're talking here just in your division, the things you've just described, and I appreciate you being really straightforward about it, it's 2.7 for all of that under the wet goes list. Is that That's correct? Right. That's right. And at some point when we have the TIMS group and the finance people look at this, I assume that will be disaggregated so we can look at that line by line? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, we're going to um, move forward with uh, maintenance operations group's uh, report out. But I, I do want to address one comment that you made. Um, we were looking across the organization about and, and assessing where we could potentially uh, make cuts. The other option, um, and this is something that is not in my talking points, but that I shared with the team, I said, if we were a starfish, what arm could we cut off? And what would that do? Where could, if we removed one of our divisions, if we removed a group and moved either that work over, those people, you know, something, what would that look like? Because the option could be that this council directs us, well, this group is 10 million, this is this many million, this is this many million, do that, and that gets you to your 32. Um, that was really, uh, really very challenging. That's not the option that we would choose. Um, so that this, what we're sharing speaks to the dire nature of where we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Williams. My name is Jody Yates and I'm the Maintenance Operations Group Director. 
Maintenance operations is comprised of 400 people who repair and maintain our transportation and sewer systems, 130 people for sewers and 270 for transportation. Our teams fill potholes, pave streets, install traffic signs and striping, reconstruct ADA corner ramps, pick up leaves in the fall, maintain city bridges, sweep downtown, perform graffiti abatement, and perform emergency response for winter weather, landslides, flooding, and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions uh, if and when those occur. Under this funding reduction, maintenance operations will continue to perform paving operations, but only that funded by Fix Our Streets. The $3 million reduction will result in 15 lane miles not being repaved. This is a 50% reduction in maintenance paving. We will fill potholes, but on a longer time frame than our current service delivery timeline of 30 days. We will remove vegetation for safety, but not for aesthetics. For example, we will, we will no longer mow the Ainsworth Park blocks. We will continue fall leaf pickup, street sweeping on busy streets in downtown. As a reminder, uh, we already eliminated residential street sweeping this fiscal year. We will continue to maintain bridges and repair damaged guardrail and minor landslide response would remain. We will continue the gravel street program. It is funded by Fix Our Streets. Sewer repair and cleaning will remain as they are funded in partnership with the Bureau of Environmental Services. So what is eliminated? All crack seal paving maintenance, mowing and vegetation management at 171 locations, maintenance of street furniture, such as the benches, bike racks, and other miscellaneous items, uh, maintenance of stairwells and retaining walls, and graffiti abatement on all PBOT assets will be eliminated. What is reduced? There will be a traffic striping reduction, 15 miles of uh, the aforementioned paving reduction. We would reduce our winter weather response. We would stop snow plowing on our secondary routes, which is about 223 lane miles. And then finally, maintenance operations, as others have indicated, does work on, a, on behalf of the other parts of our bureau, including parking signage and small capital projects. And this work would also be reduced and or eliminated. That's it. All right. Um, first of all, Tim, uh, just put, put in the hamper for, for later. Um, graffiti abatement, since we've now stood up the Portland Environmental Management Office, maybe there's an opportunity to consolidate. Mike Jordan, I, I don't know if you're hiding here somewhere or watching, that there might be an opportunity there. Uh, could you give me an example of a secondary route or a couple of secondary routes I'm, I might know? Um, I, I have the map available if you'd like to have one. Do, do you just happen to know any off the top uh, of your head? I, just, I don't know. What, what the portion of like say 52nd where it connects between Foster and Holgate, or I'm sorry, uh, Powell. Okay, would, but all of the primary routes would stay. Primary and emergency served. transportation routes would remain. Okay. And, and the fundamental uh, is that 31, reducing the vacancy or reducing 31 positions, we physically wouldn't have the operators to drive those routes. Okay, and of the things that are on the what goes list, from a maintenance perspective, which one is the least palatable to you? Just as a transportation operations leader, as you look at that list, which one of these is not palatable. They're all painful. <laughs> well, um, here, let me give you an example of what I'm getting at. So crack seal pavement maintenance seems like it's relatively low cost and relatively easy to do. And what it's doing is it's staving off massive it is, it structural is the, failures later. Is, is, it does, is and right? it goes hand in hand with the uh, slurry seal. Uh, program. So what we do at maintenance operations is perform the crack seal a season prior to the slurry seal contractor coming behind. So they're hand in hand programs. We perform part of the work and then the uh, contractor comes in and performs that, that pavement portion, uh, that slurry seal application. So these are coordinated reductions. We remove one, we remove the other. Uh, from a safety perspective, reducing striping frequency is, is a painful response to put out there, as are though, uh, I mean, so many of them are painful and these were the later on cuts that we had to do, but we've been taking reductions for years. 
Okay, have, have all of these been graded in terms of their impact on long-term maintenance as well as safety? Has, has, was, was there some sort of a process you went through or is this based on public input? How, how did you come up with this list? And, and maybe, Director, I'm sort of curious how you came up with any sure. of these. Sure, it's a combination. List. Yes, we took the feedback from community. We took guidance from council in terms of uh, re reprioritizing our work um, and our strategic plan. Um, but when we asked each of the leaders in the spaces to identify what the options might be, uh, they assigned uh, risk to uh, the, the reductions that they proposed. Um, we did think about the downstream effects of failures to do some of this work. Again, we would be a very different organization if we aren't able to do the work. And um, it would, um, it, it was not without uh, consideration for the, the long-term effects. And if in fact, and I'll, uh, uh, Todd and, and um, Jody can speak to this uh, from their engineering expertise uh, in terms of delay of work, the uh, greater impact of delay of work today could make uh, a project 10 times more expensive. I'm not just yeah, exactly. I totally, yeah. totally understand that. And then just one final thought, and then I'll move on. Uh, I'm sure, sure our lawyers are twitching heavily on some of these in terms of the liability that would it create. Um, I noticed mowing and vegetation management, that doesn't seem like a big deal, except did the city it's a huge deal. just end up paying a massive settlement for failing to trim the bush around a stop sign? Absolutely. That led Sir, to a very uh, nice Mayor Wheeler, um, actually when I did my evaluation, I, I evaluated against the three core, which were uh, community safety, maintenance, and livability, and then I also had risk and liability. Um, all the people, or all the safety, the safety office is within my purview, and I get to review every single claim uh, that comes into, um, Peabot, okay. and uh, interestingly, most of them are potholes, um, so our pavement is failing. We have an increase of 50% over last year, so it's, it's not where we would want to reduce, but pothole is a Band-Aid, um, and it's really the longer-term paving maintenance that will actually reduce that yeah. liability. I, I but I did ev evaluate those in my matrix because, to Director Williams' point, I'm an engineer. We must make a matrix. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank I had a you. quick question. So of the 31 positions, 13 vacant, you've listed here, how many of them are unionized? Uh, two of those are non-rep and the remaining are represented. So we're talking elimination of 29 family wage jobs here? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, I'm glad you... Um, uh, uh, you, you raised uh, that question. I'll, one of the things I need to warn my colleagues about is that uh, should we do uh, cuts at PBOT, it will also impact some of the bureaus that uh, you folks oversee because of bumping rights and whatnot. So the cuts that happen in the PBOT space uh, will echo will spill over to other bureaus too, and it will create a, a chaotic, um, a chaotic moment in terms of personnel at the city. Thank you, and I'll turn the floor back over to staff. So Mark. All right, good morning. My name is Mark Williams. I'm the uh, interim director for parking and regulatory. In 2019, we employed 73 parking enforcement officers. Between 2019 and 2023, several positions were cut, reducing that number to 59 enforcement officers. The additional reductions proposed today would reduce that number to 23. We will continue to provide enforcement by exploring different ways to deploy existing staff to reduce further impact to bureau revenues. However, as a result of these cuts, routine enforcement in the parking meter and permit districts will be directly impacted. When enforcement activities are reduced, we also realize a reduction in compliance levels. Simply put, some drivers will not pay to park or purchase parking permits. Residential area enforcement will also be reduced. We will explore different ways to deploy strategies with existing officers, but abandoned vehicles, derelict RVs, and other vehicles in violation will remain in the right-of-way for extended periods of time, impacting safety and livability in our communities. 
I have confidence in our team, and although at a reduced level, some of this work will continue. Constituents and businesses, businesses requesting curb and driveway striping, parking signs, and residential ADA <coughs> parking will also be affected, as well as the work that we do related to Bureau capital improvement projects. Existing parking district committees will no longer have Bureau staff support. We will be unable to move forward with the development or expansion of new parking districts, metered and non-metered. However, we will continue to sell uh, our <coughs> annual parking permits for existing districts. Parking studies, data collection, outreach, planning would not be funded. This work is critical to the Bureau's performance-based parking program pursuant to this council's direction and three, and, uh, excuse me, in resolution 37204. Finally, parking meters will be affected by a reduction in replacement, repairs, and graffiti removal. We don't have any questions, Art? I, I have one, okay. just, I you know, so. and, and I, I just don't know the answer to this. Uh, parking enforcement is not a revenue center for the city. Is that correct? Net, or is it? So when you do the numbers, Mayor, parking enforcement, based on the number of average citations that they write, does not generate revenue. However, there is an assumption that parking enforcement officers out there actively enforcing, enforcing does com, you know, uh, increase compli compliance, mm -hmm. meaning people are more likely to pay at the meter sure. and sure. purchase parking permits. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. If there are no further questions, Art. All right, um, on to policy planning and projects. I'm Art Pierce, Director of Policy Planning and Projects. Uh, so policy planning and projects is where the future of our transportation system is envisioned and specific project investments and program responses are devised, funded, and implemented. A small investment in PBOT GTR leverages a myriad of outside investments and results in big things, including projects in our Bureau's $150 million plus annual capital improvement program and nationally recognized community serving programs. In just the past few years alone, the planning team has successfully pursued over $230 million in state and federal funds that will improve the city and help sustain the entire Bureau for the coming years. These 47% reductions shown here would reduce policy planning and projects to the most basic services, delivering primarily externally funded activities for planning programs with minimal ability to develop new projects and respond to community concerns. This would significantly diminish the future capital program including the need for engineering and contracting services, likely resulting in a cascade of future reductions. While this maintains the $1.5 million in match for federal projects, as we already discussed, these reductions would significantly cut the small capital safety project investments, which are key to our responsiveness to community concerns. And it's important to note that the reductions, FTEs are shown here, are both within the policy planning group, as well as in engineering and maintenance operations teams because of how the work is implemented through financial ties. These reductions would also reduce support and engagement for bike, ped, transit, and ADA, including our modal committees. Work on public plazas and collaboration with community, business, and neighborhood groups to develop projects and program responses that address dire safety, health, and economic needs. Community programming is also heavily reduced or eliminated, including Sunday Parkways, Safe Routes to School, the Transportation Wallet, Equity Partnerships, and the PSU Transportation Class. This is how PBOT supports people access to a healthy and sustainable transportation system. Lack of attendance to these existing de deficiencies and the challenges of growth will lead to further disappointment in our community and our partners and reduce willingness to co-invest in our community. Portland will also miss out on unparalleled federal investment, losing ground as a model city for sustainable transportation and in reaching our safety, climate, and equity goals. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Uh, I'm just a little bit confused because I want to point out that the transportation wallet, from what I understand, is already in the climate investment plan. So I want to understand why it's under what goes. And then also, I also know there are a number of items on this list and, and the, the one, one of the ones before 
um, like the streetcar replacements and also bike town and other various uh, programs um, that are PSEF eligible. And I know that our staff has been talking to your staff. Right. So um, they're just waiting for the data um, from your team to kind of finish out those discussions. So I just, sure. I think it's just important to, to put that out there to the public. Yeah, so you. I just want to reconcile that from what I'm seeing here. For sure. So the, the general transportation revenue that's shown here is eliminated from investing in those programs. There is a, a great moment of synergy between this conversation and the conversation around PSEF and how PSEF can invest in these programs. Uh, PBOT, under this level of reduction, is not able to invest in those programs and is proposing the elimination or vast reduction of them. Um, I think I would really welcome a further conversation. We've already had lots of conversations with the, the PSEF team about ways that PSEF can be a sustaining partner and investor in these programs that we would otherwise be reducing or heavily eliminated. One great example, we have a quick build program and a Safe Rest of School program deeply collaborating with community already a pipeline of staff that are able to deliver that work, and PSEF could be an investor in that pipeline with PBOT's team responding and using you as a, the PSEF team as a client base, that we are um, using our, our resources and our deep relationship with the community to deliver on the goals of PSEF. Yeah, and I appreciate yeah. that. And yep. um, it's just, I think it's just a little confusing because it says what goes, and we're talking about it in a right. public forum. Maybe. And I just want to Sure, so know, we can put an asterisk uh, if, unless PSEF is able to, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, I think you're Or maybe what tomorrow. goes from the it general fund. It would be fund. removed from our, <laughs> from, it would be, it would be removed from, from, from PBOT's general yeah. transportation revenue expenditure we would right. assume based on the conversations that we've had right. uh, and the allocation that has already been identified uh, I believe it's 25 million dollars for transportation wallet right right that, that would pick so that, that up so that, would, that so this is one element that would be the PSEF would be becoming the, the the sole investor in that because PBOT's not able to afford it given this level of cuts um, and Commissioner Maps and I have already talked about yeah. this, you know, about um, once the dust settles on what you feel you're going to continue doing or not doing going forward, that um, there's a commitment in place for us to talk about what could be funded that's PSEF eligible. But I want to be clear that it has to go through the PSEF committee uh, yep. to do that. But no, uh, we are experts at uh, external funding partnerships and really happy to do a deep collaboration with the PSEF committee. So. Thank you, I, I guess, I mean, two thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, one is whether our investment plan puts sufficient resources into transportation decarbonization, you know, and that's a broader uh, question before council, I guess, tomorrow. I, I would submit, I, I'm not sure we are putting sufficient dollars there, um, and particularly looking at these pain points. Second, to Commissioner Rubio's point, it would be helpful to get an asterisk here on the items sure. that it seems plausible under existing, you know, sort of PSEF conceptualization are likely to be retained in some format, just so we can kind of parse through this, what, what, what incremental decisions are we facing right now? Right. You know, that, that, that would help. We've, we've done some analysis of that, so we have, we have sort of a, a tabulation of where we see there's some cross uh, connection. So. It, but, the, but the third, and this is where, you know, we take a step back, the role of government, the role of our nonprofits and some of our more innovative organizations. I mean, PSEF has opened up this gigantic funding source for certain types of programming. At the same time, PBOT is f facing some really challenging, you know, revenue <laughs> issues. And consciously or unconsciously, we're shifting maybe for some of this programming from government provided to nonprofit. I don't know that that was a conscious choice, but that is what's in some ways happening. I mean, you know, it, Sunny Parkways, for example, like that, I, I, I can't see that plausibly going away, in, in, given the importance of the, to the community. But what we may be doing here indirectly is saying, well, the government's no longer going to do that. Nonprofits are going to do it because they have better access to funding for this type of program. And again, it's not conscious. We did, I mean, that's just the way it's evolving. And I, I, I just, I'm putting that out there as, watching this trend. I'm not sure entirely it's a healthy one. Uh, I bring go back to unionized workforce and family wage jobs. We are exporting these jobs to nonprofits who don't have the same labor commitments that government entities have that has other implications. And I, um, but that may be where we're at. And I think in, in particular for this conversation, we have a, a set of long tenured 
deeply committed staff people who have relationships in community, have relationships and actually deep partnerships with a variety of nonprofits. Um, and so uh, I think that there's a, there really is a great opportunity for PBOT to be enlisted as a, a, a delivery partner with those nonprofit entities and uh, with the PPS team on ensuring that we are um, getting the, the, the funding out the door and delivering the programs to the expect expectations and with the accountability that everyone desires. So. Yeah, a couple things. Um, I appreciate the dialogue about partnerships and how this blends into other parts of our budget. And I do think Sunday Parkways is a great example. We know that Parks is very active in that as well. Yep. I know our staff, I think just a couple of days ago, asked for that line item so we could go deeper in that conversation. Sure. I really appreciated, uh, even though I heard what you said, that it's really impossible to say one FTE is purely in one of these areas. That said, I've enjoyed writing down um, the numbers, Todd, I think you said 115. I heard, you know, 400 under maintenance. I didn't hear a number on uh, staff. Uh, total staff, I think we're at 95. 95, oh, yeah. The, okay. uh, yeah, one of the final slides provides you. Yeah. Um, oh, there is a, there is a I don't have to keep that. doing this. <laughs> you don't have to keep adding it up. But it's lovely to have it on this factoid on the yeah, far right. It was, uh, yeah. for me. I think, the second to last yeah. slide. Yeah. Yeah. What? Something like that. It is there. I'm just smart. I cheated. Yeah. Attorneys do that. Was that, was that okay, thank you. Uh, Wendy. Thank you. I'm Wendy Cauley. Um, I'm the group director for traffic systems and operations. Uh, just so you know, Commissioner uh, Ryan, we do have 80 staff in our group, approximately 80 staff. I've got others. <laughs> right. The traffic systems and operations section keeps Portland moving. They do this through the design and operation of city streets and safe work zones and through the design and operation of traffic signals and street lights. In traffic systems, the bulk of discretionary GTR goes toward maintenance of traffic signals and street lights. The other GTR funded program in traffic systems is 823 SAFE, which responds to safety requests from the public such as stop signs, pedestrian crosswalks, and parking removal. The first round of cuts held both signal maintenance and 823 SAFE harmless. Further cuts resulted in a $2.4 million cut in traffic systems, about 24% of our total GTR, and the elimination of eight positions, four of which are currently vacant. The proposed cuts in traffic include a 50% reduction to signal and street lighting maintenance. This includes graffiti removal. With these reductions, crews will typically only be able to respond to emergency events. As the age of our assets increases, so does the risk of emergency events. In the past five years, we have had several of the 60 plus year old downtown ornamental street lights fall down. The historic lights on Terwilliger Parkway are the same lights that were recently removed from city parks and are an additional liability for the city. Cutting the maintenance budget is not advisable, but a risk we are unable to avoid. In addition to an aging system, vandalism, vandalism of traffic signals and street lights has increased dramatically and resulted in an increased backlog of lights needing repairs. In recent years, the backlog of damaged streetlights grew to 134. 25 lights were added to that backlog in just the last year. A 50% reduction to street lighting maintenance is expected to add 50 lights to the backlog annually. Additionally, partnering funds to assist developers with expensive signal upgrades will be eliminated. 823 Safe, PBOT's traffic safety community response team, is being cut reserving just one permanent position to assist city attorneys with claims and other federal requirements like railroad coordination. Lastly, the traffic systems group director, my position, will be eliminated, assuming that the traffic systems group will merge with another PBOT group. Remaining traffic divisions and sections are supported by permit fees and capital project funding and will remain intact to support those programs. We can go to the next slide. So, $32.6 million reduction leads to 127 total FTEs also being reduced, 39 of those currently being vacant and being held until the next fiscal year, until we determine what can happen. Those service, these services and staffing reductions will have a huge impact on PBOT and the Portland transportation system. We will not be the bureau that you see today if all of this moves forward. And as Commissioner Maps has mentioned, 
uh, we are not the only bureau that will be impacted. There are bumping rights in place for many of these represented positions. As a reminder, with the new formation of the CPPW Labor Union, most positions within the city are now represented. Bumping would reassign staff based on seniority to alternative positions, potentially in other bureaus, creating a complex domino effect across the entire city workforce. So what is the path forward? There are two options on the table for us today. We can begin to implement solutions with your support to stabilize the transportation budget, or we must begin the work of preparing for budget reductions. As we've been working through this process, the immediate actions we'll need to take have become clearer. If we move forward with budget reductions, we'll need to start the following right away. A full-scale bureau reorganization. We've already begun, but we'll continue to consult with BHR about the layoff and bumping process. We will alert other bureaus of potential bumping actions. This includes the Bureau of Environmental Services, Water, Parks, Planning, and Sustainability, and more. While it's unclear still exactly what those bumping impacts will be, they could be significant to parts of the city's workforce. We'll also begin to communicate about coming service reductions so people know what services we can still provide and what, unfortunately, we will no longer be able to do. We'll engage potentially impacted partners regarding service levels, including the Portland Fire and, uh, Portland Fire and Rescue, Portland Police, Portland Public Schools, and other school districts, TriMet, and other city bureaus. This process has forced the PBOT executive team to rise above our individual priorities and see PBOT for what it is, a vital organization providing a wide array of interconnected services. We ask of the council to avoid the temptation to focus their attention on saving a few programs and instead attend to the structural challenge that has brought PBOT to this dire position so what are some possible solutions? We've been looking at other cities. You asked about this, Commissioner Ryan, uh, how they fund their transportation systems. We're not alone in struggling with higher costs, as you also mentioned, um, and problems with relying on funding tied to fossil fuels. What we have found is that each city has a somewhat unique mix of funding strategies. However, we see that some cities do have additional funding tools in their toolbox. As you can see, some of the funding mechanisms like sales tax and vehicle registration fees are not currently possible for Portland. Some would require a vote or action at the state level. And a number of cities and states are looking into vehicle miles traveled mechanisms like Oregon's road user charge. This will hopefully be a viable tool for the future, but we cannot count on it in the near term. There are also few common tools like parking fees, street fees, or the category of street fees, street damage restoration fees uh, that we could implement or increase here. We've also seen that there are a number of cities that get a greater amount of support from their city's general funds. We've given, excuse me, <clears throat> we've given some thought to how the city could provide additional support to PBOT. One option would be restoring the utility licensing fee payments to PBOT. Utility license fees are collected from various utilities, water, sewer, gas, electric, and cable, as rent for the use of the right-of-way. These funds are collected and dispersed within the general fund. There is a fundamental relationship between charging utilities for the use of the right-of-way and funding the Bureau of Transportation, which is responsible for maintenance of the right-of-way. In 1988, the Bureau of Transportation was separated from the general fund. As part of that separation, Council set a target of 28% of utility, utility license fee revenues to be allocated to meet the funding needs of the city's transportation system. Due to shortfalls in general fund resources in subsequent years, the targeted transfer has never come to fruition, leading to a lost investment of $585 million in transportation asset and programming since 1988. Restoration utility license fee payments would amount to $25 million in annual funding to the Bureau of Transportation. This, rec this restoration could be directed by Council now to avoid PBOT cuts. The adjustment could be implemented over time to minimize the immediate impact on other bureaus. But yes, there would be an impact on other bureaus. Can I pause right there? You Quick sure question. can. So yes. I'll go back here. So, would, so when we talk water or um, sewer, would that just be straight pass through to pay, rate payers? 
No, under the current funding stream, so water and sewer pay into the general fund for their utility license fee, in, in essence, and so it would be no increase to those services. It's just utilizing those resources already in the general fund and transferring them to PBOT, which would have an effect on all the other bureaus. So out of public safety fund. and into PBOT. Yes, you could summarize it in that way. We yes. anticipated that question, yes. I, I'm not, maybe offline you can explain to me the mechanics of that and why that's not reflected in rates, the rate payers pay. I'm not sure I 100% follow, but we can take that offline. Okay. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Another way for the city to uh, support transportation, which I know will be wildly popular, uh, would be for other general fund bureaus to take small reductions to more evenly spread city resources across city services. You can see on this slide how much could be raised for transportation from different levels of reductions to other general fund supported bureaus. You could also allocate general fund resources for specific programs that provide citywide services that are currently listed uh, as being paid for by transportation, such as the ones listed here, the derelict RV removal, Selwood Bridge debt, Portland Milwaukee light rail debt, Homeless cleanup, uh, homeless campsite cleanup, ADA curb ramps, and community events. City general fund is not the only option. There are other potential revenue options. We started the conversation with Commissioner Rubio's introduction of our consideration of PSEF funds. Uh, given that transportation sector uh, contributes 40% of carbon emissions and uh, most of PBOT's work allows uh, people to take less carbon intensive modes, we continue to see a lot of overlap between some of our programs and services and PSEF. We also manage and operate the streetcar, a large electric transit service uh, that serves many community members. We also believe there are some programs for other bureaus to contribute toward some of the programs and services that benefit them or their missions in addition to ours. Finally, we can raise new revenue through parking or implement new fees, such as a street, street damage restoration fee, which I did mention before, a street fee, which I've mentioned before, and other potential right-of-way fees. We know that none of the budget stabilization, stabilization ops, excuse me. We know that none of the budget stabilization, <laughs> we get it. Stabilizing the budget will be challenging and none of the options are easy. However, these budget reductions will not be easy to take either. We're hoping we can return soon to talk about some of those stabilization options, uh, but this does end our presentation and we're happy to entertain any questions and address any concerns. Could you go back to the slide on what other cities are doing? Sure. In terms of revenues for transportation, please. So I may be mistaken, my memory is not what it used to be, but I thought we actually got a VRF carve out from the legislature when we were rebuilding the Selwood Bridge. In other words, I, I think we made a case to the legislature and they agreed. I can be wrong on that, but it, that, that rings a bell to me for some reason in the Wayback Machine. I, my memory is that Multnomah County received the carve out for the Selwood Bridge. This, this came from a specific uh, bill passed in the state legislature. Yeah, and I, I was the Multnomah um, County chair. Right, right. All right, then, there you go. Yes, um, and that's why I'm yeah. remembering it, yeah, though so, somewhat vaguely. Yes, this specific debt came from an increase in the gas tax that instead of going into our general budget was set aside for the debt service for the Selwood Bridge as part of our contribution okay, so to the project. Okay, I, so I'm somewhat reluctant to say not possible. Um, what I would say is requires legislative approval. And I Thank think you. With, with this conversation, there's no reason why we could not have this conversation with government relations and our legislative leadership and indeed the governor on these issues. Um, community vote, I'm assuming your polling that you did did not include polling around those three sources that you identify, but we um, did have not yet. Um, we're preparing to. I'm sorry. We're preparing to do another. Go ahead, uh, Shoshana. Oh, uh, 
uh, Shoshana Cohen, Intergovernmental Resources and Policy Affairs. Uh, so we did, a, a, you'll see in your packet, there were some sort of initial questions around these, although we are also getting ready, um, as we sort of think about fixing our streets, to do a, a poll that is much more targeted around uh, around people's appetite for different revenue. All right. I mean, ultimately, these assets belong to the public, and they should be involved in this discussion as well. I will just tell you I'm, I'm reluctant at this point without the benefit of going through the budget office to really talk about the forecast or talk about the potential costs associated with these, but you know, we'll, we'll certainly take a look at it. I come with a sense of concern that this has come to us late in the game. And the question before us is, are we willing to take funds out of police, fire, 911 emergency response, and general emergency management in order to fund PBOT? And you're not the only bureau, who's just, just to be clear, sure. um, who's, who's going to make that case. Generally speaking, I'm also concerned that these reductions are being looked at in a vacuum. The context in which we're having this conversation is that our city is in crisis and it is very, very slow to recover from the economic downturn associated with COVID and all of the other issues that we've dealt with in this city. We need activation. We need events. We need to bring community together. We need to support safety issues so that people feel that they can walk and that they can bike safely in our community. And so I'm, I'm not willing frankly, to accept most of the cuts that were put on the table, but nor am I willing to take resources that are desperately needed in public safety away from public safety at a time when the community is saying their number one overarching issue is safety. And Absolutely. so I, I think we have to look at it that way. Um, so I'll, I want to drill down further on the forecast, some of the decisions that, that you're offering up. I really appreciate the directors the individual directors being here. Um, number one, it's good to get to know you a little bit better and understand the work that you do at uh, a more detailed level, and I respect and appreciate the spirit in which you're here today. Obviously, we have an opportunity as we move to a new form of government. We're consolidating everything. A lot of the individual items that were listed on the let go list are items that, frankly, we need to be doing enterprise-wide. So maybe there's some opportunities here to leverage the discussion we're having around bureau consolidation and some of the concerns you have around funding some of these programs. I think we, we should integrate those Absolutely. discussions. Uh, but th those are my thoughts. I, Commissioner Maps, you always get the, the last word, but maybe somebody else wants to have some. I'll create to say. some space for my colleagues to talk. Oh, go ahead. I wasn't really ready, but that usually doesn't stop me. Um, I think that when you do the final slide that's, that shows the or equation, I think what we're doing right now is we're having open dialogue about the problem, and then we need to prioritize. So I just think that's what's important. It would be above that. I find the or to be pretty extreme right now, and I think if we continue to have this dialogue about how the bureaus can work together and we get out of our silos and we look at then the priorities that I thought the polling was really helpful with that, um, it will make it a lot easier. So I hope that we all lean into the prioritizing that we're doing right now as we talk about these. I'll, and then there's a story I wanted to just elaborate on. When I heard about the signals and the increase in damages to them and that, that who, who said that? Wendy. Sorry. And you were the one that was kind enough to tell me how many employees that you have as well. Um, I want to know more because, Mark, when you talked about um, the compliance, that what's important about having uh, the patrols, if you will, for um, parking tickets and such, it's not a net revenue gain. But if we didn't have them, then there would probably be no compliance. So I'm kind of getting at that same question here. Like, what's the pro like? Do we know if anyone ever gets prosecuted for? Is there any consequences when someone damages our, um, our traffic signals? Or right now, is it, there's a lack of compliance, so it just is escalating. That was an alarming number, what I heard from you. Yeah, um, we, if signals and streetlights are damaged from traffic crashes, Oh, from crashes. Uh, we can sometimes 
we because there's know, an increase of that. There's an increase. Okay. Yeah, there's an increase in that, and we can follow up and get some insurance money from some of those um, types of damage. But the um, the vandalism. Thank is, you. The vandalism yeah. and breaking thank into you. access yeah. power is we cannot track that, and so that goes unchecked. We don't have cameras that that give evidence, and there's no nothing in the prosecution world. There's, so there's no compliance for that. That's right. And what the data suggests, that's been increasing at, a, at an alarming rate, is what it sounded like. Yeah, that's correct. So when all of us look at our, you know, you have the big city priorities, obviously, community safety is at the top of that list with many Portlanders, and that would suggest why we're having the economic downturn that we're in. Um, and then, you, then we have priorities that we have from the polling and priorities, I'm sure, amongst all of you. So I think we just have to continue to crosswalk all of these and that's part of the, the pre-work that we're doing. So the OR equation that we're looking at right now should be more sophisticated than the one I'm looking at at the moment. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Rubin, did you have any? Oh, you can go. Um, I guess a, just a couple summary thoughts. I, I echo the mayor's take. I, I will not support cutting public safety to address PBOT. I just, that's not palatable at this point in the city's history from my vantage point. Um, I do think that, um, I, I think when we talk about gas tax and parking fees, um, at minimum, I think we should be thinking about indexing those going forward to have some predictability in revenue um, in just to take, stay up with inflation. And it's unfortunate that we are where we are in, in terms of parking fees. It, if I wish we had indexed 10 years ago. We'd be at a different place now. Because every time we talk about raising it, it sets off a firestorm because it's sort of this, such a significant change at any one time. And I just wish we could lock and load that annually. Um, I continue to think, you know, PSEF has been opened some doors and whether we're fully exploring that for some of the things that PBOT does. Uh, and I share my colleague's observation, there may be some opportunities with re reorganizing bureaus. Can we consolidate some positions? Uh, I will just leave one, I'm looking at the polling here and it was last slide that, you know, you did, you did test some uh, revenue sources with voters, generally fairly negative uh, uh, in their appetite. And it's not surprising. Uh, we've seen dramatic increase in tax burden since 2020 in the region. Um, but I, I do think we have to leave it on the table as a possibility. Um, and ideally, we can offset it somewhere else. But it, it save them some other taxes. But you know, PBOT needs to be supported. It's our core infrastructure. And um, so I, I'll just leave it at that. There's no easy solutions here. I, but like I said, I do want to open up some of those other potential sources for core infrastructure investment, including PBOT. Thank you, there. Commissioner. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Director Williams and all of the directors for being here uh, and updating us on what's ahead. Um, I, I want to acknowledge the dire position that the Bureau is in, and I'm really open to the conversations that we started here today. I know the next step for us is all to decide um, what, you know, what are the top priorities for PBOT and where else we can find some of these services as we've all discussed, um, or funds in support of these services. Um, I do want to share that I, I strongly feel that ensuring safety on our roads for all is um, a top priority at the top of that list, as 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 the mayor mentioned, and um, we need to make sure that we continue to focus on that. If we don't have safety on our streets, then um, th that's the baseline for everything here and the through line, um, and especially how we look at how we support efforts to reduce um, emissions through electrification um, and other tra multimodal transportation modes. I'm very open to discussing ways to collaborate on those on that work. So Thank you. Um, I'm ready for the conversation. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. I wanted to take a moment want to thank you for this presentation. I have all of you here. It was really um, helpful. I want to acknowledge um, in one of our priorities, obviously, is homelessness. And having PBOT be a great partner to build the Safe Park Village has been really, really helpful. You have the most knowledge. And um, people at Salvation Army just give a lot of kudos to, to the way that you're showing up. And so thank you for that. I know that looks like it could be on the list of um, a priority that all bureaus are facing because it's such a big issue right now. So I wanted to just put that out. And again, 
this isn't simple. Like when you talk about you don't want to cut from public safety, well, PBOT does public safety. And so this is so complicated and how we keep, we will need to keep overlapping um, everything. I think what's sad for me is the backdrop today of the fact that our TriMet um, met, uh, ridership is down, um, bike commuting is down, and so we also have to look at why is that. Um, a personal story at home is that um, we're a one car family, but my partner takes, my spouse takes um, Max every day. And not everyone would survive that trip. It's, it's alarming how many days I hear stories, real stories, of uh, public safety being at risk, taking a max from North Portland out to um, the David Douglas School District. And so we have to bring TriMet to the table on a public safety issue so we can see how we can get ridership up. It's really a big issue in our city right now. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. I'm not sure, I don't have the, as much information on why bike commuting is down. I assume it's because we have less people um, doing in-person work, but I don't know all the, all the data on that. Could be connected to public safety as well. So I just think it's important that we overlap that with the concern that one of the goals that this council had, the city has, was to increase um, transit, was to increase uh, bike ridership. And I know when I go to other cities, I always take man's transit to get a, because I'm on city council and I want to understand what's going on. And there's nothing better than taking public transportation to get a sense of how that city's doing. And we're not looking good, you know, and I've ridden it in a lot of other cities right now. And it's, um, and I think it's why the buses are doing better than max is because on buses, you must at least go through the point of entry of um, pain before you get on. That's the only thing I can think of. But in other cities, I usually notice that they pay as they enter. But I know this isn't in your direct purview. It's but not. It's like we do. Um, we do manage and maintain uh, Portland streetcar, so uh, that Rick is a, a mass transit um, uh, mode uh, that we have opportunities to influence and share information about. Um, but that system is challenged as well. Aside from just the replacement of the cars, the ridership, and the challenges that the uh, operators and security staff are facing per the public safety concerns that have been raised. Thank you. Commissioner Apps, before you uh, close us out, I'm assuming that's what you were about to do, I just wanted to uh, thank this council for your time today, for your recommendations, for listening to um, our thoughts about ways that we could get to that $32 million cut. Um, it is an imperfect science, and we recognize that um, it was uh, likely going to be a difficult conversation for us both to have and for you to hear and for our teams to hear. Um, we would that we would not have to make those choices. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing what's uh, in the best interest of all Portlanders, um, of all of our system users. Uh, and that we're creating the dependability and the safety that everyone not only um, wants, but that they deserve. Um, doing that with what we're faced with, um, with um, information that uh, may be uh, new in its presentation, but it's not new. We've been sharing this information for over 20 years, so councils that preceded you have heard some version of this. Um, it's just at this moment that we are um, facing what we're facing, which we recognize bureaus across the city, businesses across the city, households across the city um, are facing, and, and not just here, but across the country. So we appreciate your, your willingness to share this time with us this morning. We look forward to ongoing conversations with your teams and with others uh, about how we can um, come together uh, around a set of solutions that will help to ensure that we're providing the services that we as the Transportation Bureau uh, not just uh, want to, but should be, and doing so in a way that uh, supports the future of the city of Portland. Thank you. And um, I'll wrap up uh, today's session by thanking uh, PBOT staff for uh, today's presentation. I also want to thank my colleagues on council for uh, today's dialogue. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, some folks who are not in the room. I'm sure we have PBOT staff who are listening in um, at home or at work or will uh, later on today. Um, we certainly have transportation um, advocates uh, who will be deeply disturbed about uh, uh, um, some of the choices that um, this council faces. Um, this is going to be a very challenging budget year. Um, there are no easy answers. Um, 
what I can do in my role is to be transparent with you, uh, to let you know um, how we are looking at the problem and uh, um, some of the options for moving forward. And I, colleagues, um, I, in my nine months of looking at this work, um, I, I do not expect us to find any magic bullets here. We have a $32 million hole, um, and basically there are three ways to fill that hole. We can uh, cut services, we can find new revenue sources, and we can find efficiencies. Uh, frankly, we will need to do all three. Um, and that, uh, today is the beginning of, what, of that dialogue. I very much appreciate your partnership in trying to figure this out, and um, I want to thank everyone who participated in today's conversation. And with that, Mr. Merrill, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Director. Thank you all for working hard on this presentation today. We are adjourned. <laughs>